and welcome to the Journey Church podcast. And thank you for joining us today. We hope that this podcast encourages and challenges you to help you grow in your faith. So enjoy the message. Real quick, today we're going to talk about grace um, and what grace is, but most importantly, what grace is not. Because our culture has made grace into something very clearly that it's not. And a lot of times it's our Christian culture that's making grace into something that it's absolutely not. Pa- Pastor would call this um, like some hyper grace doctrine. Um, you might be familiar with what, he, what the, the, he's called it that. And really the thought is, is that we as Christians can do anything that we want and God's grace is going to cover us. That we as Christians can just do whatever, live however, be however, be ourselves, and God's grace is going to cover us. And to tell you the truth, they're not totally wrong, but their souls are just damned. God's going to love us, right? God loves his creation. He has a total love for his creation, but his words clear that if we are to be his, we're going to be marked with holiness. So there's going to be a change in our lives that we're not going to have this mentality that we're just going to do whatever we want and God's grace can cover us. Because if we don't have that mark of holiness, then we're likely an unatoned sinner. And if we're not an an atoned sinner covered by God's blood, then we're damned to hell. Sorry to get so real with you so quick. Let's put on the big boy britches. So God loves his creation, but we're to be marked with holiness. And this is not to diminish God's grace. God's grace is enough to cover a multitude of sins. His word is very clear in saying that his grace is always sufficient. But his grace is not allowing you to keep on your sinning. Your grace can allow you to stay the same. And we're going to unpack that as we go. But first... A, a Christians to be marked with holiness. First Peter chapter one, verse 14 through 16. Here's where it says this in God's word. It says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. You see, when you first experience grace, Like Ephesians 2 would tell us, we're children of wrath, that there's no good inside of us. So we're not going to be holy without a holy God coming and taking his place in our heart. So if we're going to be truly, if we're going to truly experience God's grace, there's going to be a mark of holiness in our life that's going to change how we interact. It's going to change how we do. It's going to change the fact that we're not going to be a slave to sin anymore because God's grace really took hold of us. If God's grace takes hold of us and we still say, well, I can just do whatever I want because of grace. No, no, no. You didn't get the right grace. You got some kind of false grace and I don't know where you got it from, but it didn't come from this book. Again, we're going to look, Peter's going to go on to say in the next chapter in 1 Peter 2, 9, it says, but you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness. He didn't tell you to stay in it. He called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Again, most of you know the, the word holy simply means set apart. We're no better than, so let's not get our pride swollen up. Just as Pastor Stewart, we're called to remain humble. We're only holy because God's holy. Austin can't make himself holy at all. Austin's full of flesh and full of junk and and, and Ephesians said a child of wrath. I'm only holy because of what God does. God did in me. First Peter's talking to, to strictly what God has done inside of my life and hopefully your life so we can understand the doctrine of grace and what it is and that it's not just an excuse that we can keep on sinning and not and not change. Our, 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 our salvation comes with a mark of holiness and a change in your life. And if it didn't come with that, then we need to examine what you really got. Another thing you can do, you can check their fruit. Um, as Christians, we're not to be judgers, right? We're not to judge. And, and the world loves to throw that in, this, in your face. Like, your God says not to judge. Nobody says we can check your fruit. 
We're fruit checkers, not judgers. If somebody's examining, um, you can examine somebody and see if they possess the fruits of the Spirit. And a quick story on this, I was, I was writing this out this morning. Um, I was like, well, I'll, I'll go through the fruits of the Spirit real quick. Let me see if I can recite them real fast on my, on my notepad. And I hit them all, and I missed one. Um, and the one that I missed will be of no surprise to my wife um, because it was patience. And <laughs> yeah, God's still dealing with me on patience. Um, but check their fruit. You can check people's fruit. Um, uh, do they possess love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness? And I think he saved the best for last on that one, and it's self-control. Do people possess that? Because with grace comes the fruits of the Spirit. It doesn't come with an unchanged lifestyle. So the notion that we as Christians, and, and again, so many people are telling you this, the notions that we as Christians can just do whatever we want is not just wrong, but it's dangerous theology that will split the gates of hell wide open. It's dangerous theology. I don't know where this theology came from, but it's, it's not God's. And, and, and again, I'm not saying his grace isn't sufficient, but when we accept his grace, there is a lifestyle change. There is a holiness that is imparted to us from God and from God only. Grace is sufficient. If grace is an ocean, I'm drowning. Like, I know his grace is enough to cover your sin. I'm simply telling you that it's not going to come without a lifestyle change, without a mark of holiness in our hearts. And because if I, if I didn't tell you this and you went out and heard somebody say, well, God's grace is cool. Do whatever you want. I, I, I would, I'd be at a loss because you'd split the gates of hell wide open. Right? Grace comes with the lifestyle. We're going to keep unpacking. We're going to keep unpacking. I'm sorry. Getting ahead of myself. But before we go in to what exactly grace is not, and Romans is going to do a great job of, of doing that for us, let's unpack what grace actually is. I've got a very simple definition that I concluded from multiple sources. Um, and the simplest definition of what grace is, is the free and unmerited favor of God as manifested in the salvation of sinners, the free and unmerited favor of God as manifested in the salvation of sinners. Key words here, free and unmerited, free and unmerited, meaning before we start getting prideful, you didn't earn it and you didn't deserve it. Austin didn't earn God's grace, nor did Austin deserve God's grace at all. None of us did. At all. I mean, we're children of wrath, and we, we, God saw us knowing we were going to turn our backs on him and send his son to die so that we could have this grace and still be messed up people, and we're still going to fall in the face of adversity. We're still going to stumble here and there, but with grace, we're no longer a slave to God. To, to, we're no longer a slave to sin. So we're going to, again, I'm, I'm getting way ahead of myself here. All right. Free and unmerited, God's grace is free and it's unmerited, and it's the method by which we're saved. Let's take a look at Ephesians 2, verse 8. This is probably my favorite passage in the Bible. If you've ever heard me preach, you've probably heard me preach something out of Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Today we're going to focus on verse 8, or we might not get out of here by lunch. Um, but God, it's just a very simple verse. It's, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not up from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Remember, God's grace is free. It's a gift, and we can't earn it. We can only ask for it to be poured out on us. And when we do, our sins are not just forgiven, but we are freed from them. But here's, here's one thing we're going to go further. Um, I like this definition that John Piper gives when he takes the definition of grace one step further. And it says, grace in the New Testament is not only God's disposition to do good to us when we don't deserve it, often defined as unmerited favor. It's a totally right definition, but it's more. The grace of God is not just God's disposition to do good to the undeserving. It is that, but now we've seen its power. Grace is power. Grace moves in and enables me to fulfill a resolve. Without God's grace, I couldn't be up here preaching to you right now. I mean, I, I wouldn't have a hunger for God's word. I wouldn't have a hunger for holiness. 
and, and, and I, I'd be Lord knows where. I don't want to think about where I would be without God's grace. But not only does it stop at, at freeing me of my sin and the unmerited favor of God, but it's power. It enables you to do things that you normally wouldn't do. You may say, well, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm a pretty shy person, um, but I know God calls me to evangelize. God's grace can give you boldness. It can give you the power to speak your faith to people that you maybe don't know or maybe aren't comfortable with. It can give you the power and the words to say through boldness that you can now speak your faith. Um, grace gives you calmness in the face of adversity. It can give you a calmness and a peace that surpasses all understanding when you're going through trials. It can give you that peace that when the, the world can look at you and say, how are he or she so happy right now? Have you heard of all that's happened to them? Have you seen that, that so-and-so in their family died and, and then, then he lost his job? How are they still so happy? Grace enables you to remain calm and faithful in the face of adversity. When grace comes, some of the gifts of the Spirit can come. Let me give you an example, and it's a story I love to tell. One of my mentors, who's a, a pastor here, I mean, just in Decatur, um, I love this guy to death. He, he brought me, he listened to the Word of God and brought me out of a bunch of junk that I was in. Um, but he's one of the best communicators that I personally have a relationship with. And he tells a story of in high school, he hid in a bathroom to get, over, to get out of doing a speech in front of his English class. He hid in a bathroom to, and he was going to fail the class. Like he was a smart student, made like a 27 on his ACT. I mean, he was smart and he hid in a bathroom because he was afraid of public speaking. And now he's one of the best communicators that I happen to have a relationship with. Grace can enable you to, to bring forth the gifts of the spirit such as that. Because he would have never been able to speak like that. And I mean, many of you know him. It's, probably, it's Josh Wilbanks from Calvary. Amazing speaker. He spoke from this platform before. Um, amazing speaker that hid in a bathroom to get out of a public speak. Grace can change things in your life. But most importantly, what real grace can do is grace gives you the power to overcome sin. That's the one y'all should be fired up about. Because if we don't overcome sin, then we're, we're dead, right? Yeah, I mean, y'all have read in Romans, just like I have, that the wages of sin is death, yeah. right? So grace gives you the power to overcome sin. We could never do this on our own as our flesh loves sin. Our carnal flesh loves sin. So if we're going to overcome it, it's going to be by a supernatural force. And that's it. People say, well, I want to see some real miracles happen. It's like, have you seen your salvation? Have you seen the fact that you can now fight sin through the power of God? That's a miracle in and of itself that God can infest my heart and make my nose turn to sin. That's a miracle, right? Like, well, we discount these little miracles that happen all the time because we're not, I mean, you might not ever see somebody raised from the dead, but it's a miracle when God comes in your heart and gives you the power to overcome sin. That's a miracle. And again, as Piper would say, grace is power. And a lot of times that's not the kind of grace, that's the part of grace that we don't really like. I mean, especially if we're just going to consider ourselves cultural Christians, we're not going to like it. But some, some evidence that grace is power, Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. So his grace was not without effect, meaning his grace had an effect on Paul's life. Continue, he says, no, I worked harder than all of them. And then he corrects himself, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Only God's grace can take Saul, who murdered Christians from, for speaking the gospel, and turn him into the biggest apostle that the Bible speaks of. Only God's grace can do such a thing. Can we put that verse back up, please? It says, but the grace of God is what I am. The grace of God is what Paul is saying. Only his grace could turn that, could turn Paul into Saul and Paul himself to be the greatest apostle to write two-thirds of the New Testament. Um, and, and I love how he corrects himself. He says, I worked harder than all of them. He's like, wait a second. I didn't work hard. 
the grace of God that was with me worked hard inside of me and enabled me to work hard for the power of God or for the glory of God. If grace can turn Saul into Paul, I promise you it can turn your old ways into a new creation that God calls us to be. I promise you his grace is sufficient. So again, it says that grace enables you to fulfill a resolve. Um, So grace gives you the power that you need to bring forth the gospel of Jesus Christ to all the nations. As God's um, great commission would tell us to do, without grace and without this power that we get from grace and the Holy Spirit as well, we're not going to fulfill any of that. Um, And we're we're not going to have a lifestyle change. And at that point, we're just going to be the guys that are sitting there saying, yeah, grace, it just lets me do whatever I want to do, and God's still going to love me. That's the grace I like. That's not the grace of the Bible, though, and I hope you're starting to see this. If you don't get anything more of what grace is, because we're about to move to what grace is not, if you don't get anything else out of what grace is, get this. Grace leads to a repentance of sin and not an acceptance of sin. Grace leads to repentance and not to acceptance. All right, so we've talked about grace. We've talked about what it is, how it's not just, it, it, mainly what it is, it's the avenue by which we're saved, because um, we're saved, by, as, as um, Ephesians would say, by grace through faith. Um, and it was a gift of God, but it also brings a power to us that will transform our lives and give us the ability to overcome sin. What grace is not... Um, We're going to unpack Romans 6, starting in verse 1. Let me tell you something. After reading this through a hundred times, this could have easily been written for us today um, and for the cultural Christianity that seems to be plaguing plaguing the churches of today. This, This could easily have been written for today. And one more thing. Can we please get fired up about God's Word? Um, one of my main prayers for my youth group is like, that not only will they, I, I pray that they come to know Christ, but I pray that they, they love God's word. Um, I, I love to hear responses from you guys um, when I speak, and I pray that it's not my words, but the Holy Spirit's words coming through me. But my words can't be as good as God's, right? So I, 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 I want us to all be fired up about God's word. Yes, I know if, you, if you're an old wise Christian in here, you might have read it read through the whole Bible three times, but if it's a rhema word and it's alive, then it should always, always, always fire us up to hear from God. Like, I want you to hear God's words more than you hear mine, more than you hear Joey's, more than you hear any other speaker listening, be fired up about what God has to say through his word. Anyways, let's start into Romans 6, chapter 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have a new life. It's a good spot for a praise break. Anybody wants one? For if we have been united with him in death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, don't let your sin reign in your mortal body so that you may obey its evil desires. And do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, 
but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law. And we're going to stop here, but you're under grace. Let's scoot back and we're going to unpack this because God's words, like I just said, are way more impactful than mine could ever be. So we're going to scoot back to verse 1. And if you're following along, please follow along. In your Bibles, we'll have them on the screen. And we're going to unpack all that God has to say to us through Romans. So if we can scoot back to verse 1 through 4, or 1 through 2, sorry. We're going to start unpacking this. I love how Paul starts this off. And again, this is why I say this word is just as much for us today as it was for the Romans back then. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. It's like people were like, oh man, God's grace is so good. I need more of it. So I'm going to keep sinning. So God's grace is going to be even bigger. And like that just, I mean, listen to yourself talk. If, that, like, if, if that's what the Romans were saying, like, come on, Rome, y'all are smarter than this. Is grace, or shall we keep on sinning so grace may increase? By no means, if, you all, if this is all you understand today, and this is all you get from, from my message, please understand that grace is not an excuse to keep on sinning. That's, if I have one thing to say to you today, that's it. Grace is not an excuse to keep on sinning. Am I saying you're going to be absolutely perfect and you're never going to stumble or you're never going to fall again? Absolutely not. That's not what I'm saying. I stumble and fall all the time, but I get back up and I know that it's because of his grace and I'm no longer, just as Romans said, I'm no longer a slave to it. Although we may stumble and fall, we are not bound by it anymore. Meaning we don't have to indulge ourselves in this sin anymore. We're slaves. We are no longer slaves to it, but we're slaves to righteousness. Grace is not an excuse to continue your sin just because God's grace will cover it. There's a mark of holiness that we're to have, and this verse unpacks it way better than I ever could. In salvation, in our salvation, and starting in verse 2, it says, We're those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? In our salvation, we died to sin. We didn't get a free pass. All right? We didn't just get a free pass to, to keep sinning. God's word says we died to it. Meaning we're dead to it. Meaning we don't do it anymore. You don't, you don't do anything. With, if, if your dog's dead, are you going to keep going over there and petting it every day? It's going to start to stink, right? Your sin's going to start to stink because you're marked with holiness now. You're dead to it. It's going to start to stink. You're going to start to snarl your nose up at it. You ain't going to keep petting a three-week-old dead dog. That's going to be nasty. Wash your hands if you do. That's gross. You're dead to your sin. Your sin's going to start to stink. You ain't going to like it no more. It's not going to be as fulfilling anymore. Matter of fact, it's going to turn your stomach when you get into it. When you stumble and fall, it's going to turn your stomach. And you're going to realize then that God's grace is at work in your life. And you're not going to abuse that grace, but you're going to repent from your sins, not accept them. Amen. Verse 3. It says, will not you know we were baptized into Christ Jesus? We were also baptized into his death buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised again through the glory of the Father, we may too live a new life. So what do we grab from this? That we were also united in his resurrection, the resurrection that defeated sin once and for all. Hopefully we were, we're all aware of what happened when Christ was raised from the dead. One, sin entered the earth when Adam and Eve, this is going to be a real paraphrased brief version, Sin entered the earth when Eve decided she needed to eat from the apple that God told her not to eat from. So sin was always in the earth and it was unatoned for. There was no sacrifice for it. So Old Testament priests would sacrifice lambs and sacrifice calves and, and go into the altars of the most holy of holies to hear from God. It's the only way to hear from God because you had to be perfectly clean to talk to a perfectly clean God. So you had to sacrifice lambs and rams and, and calves to get to this. So because sin was in the world and there was not a perfect sacrifice for it, God sent Christ into the world through the virgin birth of Mary, and he lived a perfect life, free from sin, fully God and fully man, 
And when he was sacrificed on the cross, God poured his wrath towards sin, towards our sin, towards their sin, and towards the sins that we haven't committed yet. He poured his wrath on Christ as the perfect sacrifice so that we may be atoned for, we may be seen as spotless and blemished lamb before God. Christ made a way for us through, or God made a way for us through Christ so that we may be unified with him and brought and reconciled to him. That's a brief version, the briefest version I can give of what happened in the resurrection. But because he was, because Christ lived the perfect life, was the perfect sacrifice. When he was resurrected, he defeated death, hell, and the grave. So we no longer have to try to defeat death, hell, and the grave on our own. We have him. And because we're united in his resurrection, we can defeat sin through the power that is inside of us. I hope you caught all that because I know I just talked really, really fast. Verse 6. Um, let's see, where are we? We got, is verse 6 up? Oh, there's no numbers up there. I said, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. And that's one of my favorite parts out of this whole verse is when we become a new creation because Christ calls us through baptism and salvation that the old is gone and the new has come and we're a new creation in Christ Jesus and when we're this new creation, we're no longer a slave to sin. Sin no longer has its mastery over us. Let's go to verse 8 through 10. And I'm hoping you're starting to, to, to see a theme here. It says, now if we died with Christ, and, and we could spend all day unpacking this, but we're not. Um, like There's about four sermons in this one little passage we could roll with. But Hopefully you're, you're, you're going to go home. Hopefully you're going to unpack some more of it for yourself. Because again, God's words are way more impactful than mine could ever be. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Christ died so that your sin could die. He was raised to life so that you may have the new life that the, the New Testament promises. And I hope you're seeing a trend in all of Romans 6, 1 through 10, and that trend being sin is dead. Right? How many times has he said that, that Christ died so your sin could die? Uh, um, that, that, you know, once he became a new creation, you're no longer a slave to sin. So the trend in this passage is that sin is dead. It's not accepted. It's not verified. The sin in a Christian's life is dead. Is it going to stick its reary old head up occasionally? And you're going to stumble over it? Yes, but you have the power to stomp it back into its place. You've got the power in you through Christ to kill it if it ever tries to rear its old head up. Right? Let's move on to verse 11 through 14. Uh, it says, in the same way, count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Again, sin, dead. We are alive in Christ Jesus. Paul repeats himself time and time again in this passage. Why does he repeat himself? Because this stuff is important. It's very important. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. And what do we gather from that? That sin is a serious matter and there should be no, quote unquote, brushing it off because of grace. We shouldn't just say, it's like, yeah, I still struggle with this basically on a daily basis, but you know, grace is cool and all. There's no brushing it off. Grace enables us to kill it, not just brush it off. And because of grace, we're in verse 13, because of grace, we offer ourselves up to God as instruments of, of righteousness. And we'll read that here. It says, do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer yourselves to part of him as an instrument of righteousness for sin no longer be your master because you're not under the law, but you're under grace. It says though the power that we speak of earlier, and so sin, or, or sorry, grace is, uh, is, we, is ugh, sorry, because of grace, we're going to offer ourselves up to God because of instruments of righteousness um, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm giving myself like a B plus at talking today. I'm, I'm stumbling. But 
grace enables, or um, <clears throat> the power we spoke of earlier. So, right, we talked about what John Piper's quote says, grace is power. There's a ton of power in God's grace. It's not just there so you to brush your sin off. It's there to give you the power to defeat it. Um, it's there to give you the power to no longer be a slave to it. And it says, God's word says, we're going to be tempted. We're still going to be tempted. Heck, Jesus was spent, uh, the devil took Jesus into the wilderness and tempted him. We're going to be tempted, but because we have the same spirit, God's word would say, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. We can do just like Christ and resist the temptation, right? Because there's power in grace. God's grace doesn't come without power. And I love at the end, and, and this gets misquoted a lot. Uh, it says, for sin no or shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but you're under grace. And so, so many people are like, well, we're free from the law now. We're free from the law. I mean, how many of y'all have heard people say that when, like, as an excuse for them to keep sinning? It's like, we're free from the law. We're free from the law. Being freed from the law and under grace does not mean that the law doesn't apply. All right? It doesn't mean that it doesn't apply. All it means is because of grace, we're freed from the punishment of not upholding the law. Because you see in Romans, a few more verses down, he would say, the wages of sin is death. Because of Christ's sacrifice and because of grace, we don't have to taste death. So we're not just freed from in, in following the law. We're not freed from, from understanding God's word and doing what it says. We're freed from the punishment of when we slip up. The wages of sin is death, but we have grace. And we understand that grace comes with power and grace comes with forgiveness and grace comes with the ability to squash the sin that, that rears its head up at times to time or time to time. So it's not that we're freed from the law. We're freed from the punishment that comes with not upholding the law. We don't have to sacrifice calves and, and bulls and, and lambs. And we don't have to sacrifice that stuff anymore. Christ was the ultimate sacrifice, freeing us from the punishment of not upholding the law. And um, there's a whole nother teaching uh, of God brought the law down that no one would fulfill um, because nobody could, why did he give the law? Well, no one could fulfill the law because if we could fulfill the law on our own doing, we wouldn't need a savior. But he knew giving this law that we would need Christ. And if we need Christ, we're reliant on Christ and we're reliant on him and his grace. And there, from the grace comes a power from on high through the Holy Spirit and we can fulfill his will throughout the earth. Amen. Right? Y'all follow all that? So then, um, he, he, Paul's going to actually start another paragraph, but I love it because he repeats himself. It's like he was talking to some stubborn, stubborn Romans um, because he's going to repeat himself again, basically. Like, they must have been finding every excuse to verify and justify their sin because here in verse 15 are the same passage we were just reading from. We're just going to go down to verse 15. We stopped at 14 the first time, so we're not far off from what he was just saying. Paul says, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? By no means. By no means should we sin. And, and, and remember in verse 1 he would say, should we keep sinning so that grace may abound even more? No. We're not going to find an excuse to stay dead in our sin. Instead, we're alive in Christ and have the ability to kill our sin. Please tell me we're understanding what Paul is saying because Paul's repeating himself time and time again. And again, this word's just as much for us today as it was for the Romans back then because cultural Christianity would tell you that it's cool. Don't worry about it. Just do what feels good. God's grace is cool and all. God's grace comes with power and it comes with a mark of holiness. We're not just going to keep sinning because we're freed from the law. And as Paul would say, we're not going to keep sinning because to let grace abound even more. That's foolish. He says, by no means is that what God's trying to say. Is grace sufficient? Absolutely it is. It's sufficient to cover a multitude of sins, but it's not giving us an excuse to keep on sinning. We got that? Ronnie, you guys can come back up. God's grace is a beautiful thing. Um, it's a gift. It's unmerited favor. 
uh, or it's a gift of unmerited and, and, and uh, unmerited favor. Sorry, that's, that's the, the word that we use. Meaning we didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. But it's going to come with a power and with a lifestyle change because now we are marked with a mark of holiness. We should be fruit-bearing Christians. If God's grace is really going to take hold of our lives, then we're no longer going to be a slave to sin. Instead, we've got the ability to kill that sin. If you're writing notes, write this down. So many people want grace to deliver them from the punishment of their sin, but they don't care about the freedom from sin that it offers. Can I say that again? So many people want grace to deliver them from the punishment of their sin, which it does, but don't care about the freedom from sin that God's grace offers. Is that tough or something? Did I step on toes? I step on my own toes sometimes. Don't worry. And so if I stepped on yours, I'm not going to apologize it because God steps on mine all the time. I've said it. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Grace is not an excuse to keep on sinning. It's a power and deliverance from sin. And we have the power now because of grace to overcome it. I mean, if we're one of those that's, that say like, yeah, I want, the, I want to be delivered from my sin, but I don't care about the freedom. If we, live, if we live like grace is the freedom to do whatever we want, not only are we wrong, but we're discounting what Christ did on the cross. Yeah. We're discounting it. We're like, yeah, God you know, sent his only begotten son to watch him get brutally murdered so I can just do basically whatever I want. That's no. No, that's not what God did when he sent Christ to die on the cross. He sent it so that you can be free from sin, so that you can fulfill the word that he brought forth, so that we can go to all the nations and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not so we can sit on our rump and and just live in our sin. He calls us to be freed from it, to crucify it when 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 he was crucified. Our sin was crucified and it's dead. It didn't, the sin didn't rise again with Christ. Y'all know that, right? The sin didn't rise again. It was dead. He killed it once and for all. It's gone. Y'all ain't fired up about that. It's gone. We've got the power to overcome it. Let's stand to our feet. Maybe you're somebody in here that's just never experienced this grace. It's never experienced this, this redemption from sins and this atonement, this, the fact that Christ paid for our sin debt. He paid for the punishment that we deserve. So you're like, Austin, you, you talked about what grace is not. I don't, I've never even experienced grace in the, the beginning. And I need a Savior today, right here and right now. Um, you heard me fly over what Christ did for us when he was crucified on the cross, but he's a God that loves you. And the the Christ that fulfilled what he did on the cross loves you. I mean, how many of us would send, I don't have kids yet, but how many of us would send our only son to watch him get brutally murdered? That's a love like none other, right? You have a God that loves you, that wants to pay for the debt that we all at one time owed. And the debt, the wages of sin is death, but you have a God that wants to pay for that. So maybe that's you and say, I need to experience salvation and the initial form of grace. And, 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 that, and if that's awesome. We're going to give you a chance to meet a God and to be prayed for and to accept Christ as your Savior and to have your debt paid for. Um, but again, we're going we're gonna to also talk, speak to the person that, that I talked about. It says that somebody that may be, that you let grace deliver you from the punishment of your sin, but you have yet to accept the freedom of your sin. The fact that you're freed from it. Like, yes, God took care of the punishment of it, but now you're freed from it. And maybe that's something that you need to accept in your life and that that you have the ability to die to your sins and accept grace for all that it is. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're one of the first people I talked about that said, Austin, I need to know what grace is from the get-go. I have a, a sin debt that is not atoned for and I need a savior now more than ever to atone for my sin to to shower me with grace because his grace is sufficient 
for a multitude of sin. I can promise you, you've not been as bad as Paul or you wouldn't be with us today. You haven't murdered Christians left and right. And Paul was atoned for. Paul was saved and he was an apostle of Christ Jesus. So I promise you his grace is sufficient for you if you've never experienced before. But is there anybody in this place that says, that's me. I need a savior. I need to be saved by God so that I'm freed from the punishment of my sin. Anybody, just slip your hand up. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to bring you down front. Just a simple remark of saying, hey, that's me. I need Christ and I need him today. Anybody in this place? Amen. All right, we're going we're gonna to keep moving. We're going to keep moving. Maybe you're somebody today that says, yes, I know that God's grace is the, the freedom from the punishment but I've yet to accept the fact that God's grace is not just that, but it's also power. It's the power to squash my sin. It's the power to die to my sin and to forever bury it and the power to overcome it if it ever decides to rear its head back up. So maybe you've accepted the fact that, you're gonna, that, that His grace has delivered you from your punishment, but you haven't accepted the fact that it's freedom from your sin. You're still struggling. You're still dealing with it. You're still battling with it. But you say, today, I want to verify, I want to know, and I want to take the step forward that says, I want God's grace to be power in my life to overcome sin and to kill it. If that's you in this place, just slip your hand up. Again, we're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to call you down front. There's hands, I see them coming up all over this place. Amen. Glory to God. We're getting set free today by his grace and by his power. Amen. Amen. Real quick, we're going to go move back into a time of worship. I mean, in this time of worship, we're going to have a prayer team come down, and they're going to be extremely willing to pray for you. Matter of fact, they're all fired up to pray for you. So if you lifted your hand, I, I highly encourage you, come down and be ministered to by one, of these, um, by one of these pastors and elders on our prayer team. They want to pray, and they're here for you. And even if you didn't raise your hand, and you have a totally different want or need, that you want somebody to stand in agreement with you. Please come forth. Let us pray for you. Let us join into agreement with you. And let us let you let us bring down God's word that we're dead to sin. We don't have to live in it anymore. We're dead to it. God's grace has allowed us to do that. So before we move back into a time of worship, we're going to accept today's tithes and offerings. It's the last thing we do here at Journey Church because it's the last thing on our minds. We want you to know who God is. And we also know that God's word commands us to tie. So that's another form of worship that we should all be just as fired up about, right? If you're from another church um, and your tithe belongs in a different storehouse, please don't give it to this storehouse. Make sure you give it to the storehouse that God's called you to. So we don't want to be accessories to crime. Real quick, I'm going to pray for those that lifted their hands and said, I need God's power the grace that comes with power to punish my, to, um, to kill my sin. I'm going to pray over the tithes and offerings, and then we're going to move back into a time of worship. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word, God. I pray that your word sticks to hearts and sticks through ears, God, and not all sin's words, but your word would be the ones that penetrated us. God, I pray for those that said, I need death to my sin. I need the grace that comes with power to overcome sin, to kill sin. God, I pray that your word would come alive in their hearts and in their, and in their minds, God, that they would know that you gave us the power to overcome it, God, that we don't have to live in it anymore, Father. So God, I pray your Holy Spirit visit them and change their lives and you give them a love for you and a love for your word and a love, God, just for your presence, Father. And we thank you for that, God. God, we pray for this morning's tithes and offerings. I pray that you bless it and we receive it as a church and accountability, God. And God, we pray that you multiply it. We love to worship you through tithes and offerings. So we thank you for the ability to give because we know it's all yours to begin with. You only ask for the 10% back. And we praise you for all of this. And church, what do we say in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. Let's worship, church. Hey, we hope that you enjoyed today's message. If you would like to talk to someone about taking the next step in your walk with Jesus, we want to connect with you. Just send us an email to live at journeychurcheva.com. And we want to say a special thank you to those who give so generously to support our work here at Journey. 
If you would like to be a part of the ministry here, you can do so by going to journeychurcheva.com forward slash give. And our mission here at Journey is simple. We want to help you discover your real life purpose in Christ so that you can make a difference in your world. Thanks for joining us today. and We can't wait to see you next time.